Well, hello, everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quant. You are watching Center Court, which is our event that brings you right to the center of the top MBA programs in the world. Today, we're going to talk about the MBA in your career. And we have representatives from four institutions, uh, alums, all of whom decided to get an MBA, in many cases, a few years ago. I don't know, I think in some cases, maybe COVID may have interrupted some of their studies, but not in every case. So let me just go around the circle here or or the Hollywood squares uh, and introduce everyone. We have Brady from UMass Eisenberg. We have Tara from Baruch. Um, we have Nathan from Case Western uh, Universities, Weatherhead School of Management. And we have Robert from the University of South Carolina, the Darla Moore School of Business. Welcome, everyone. So, you know, uh, Tara, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about your professional journey and how the MBA fit into that. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Um, so I work in media um, and advertising, and I, I sort of stumbled into the career um, after my initial career in teaching turned out to not be what I wanted um, right out of undergrad. Um, and I got to the point where I thought, okay, I really like this industry, but I have a bachelor's in history. So what is that going to do for me realistically? Um, <laughs> you know, I knew I didn't want to stay and like, I listen, I had a great time as a history major, but knowing that I found myself in a business oriented career, um, sort of unexpectedly, um, I just thought, you know, what else can I do to be more, um, marketable, um, in future opportunities and just be better at my job that I'm in and future jobs. So that's what led me to, uh, pursue an MBA. Um, I spent 10 years working at a TV network where I sold and executed uh, sponsorships. You may have heard of a show called American Idol. Uh, I got my start on that show. Um, so if you know the Coke cups that were on the judges table, that was that was what I did, um, among other things. Uh, right now, I work for a media agency. Um, I work on content and partnerships for AT&T and Cricket Wireless. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, I have, have no downtime ever and it's fun and I love it. And, uh, <laughs> if the opportunity arises, um, you know, I could talk a little bit more later about how I genuinely feel getting an MBA brought me to the job I'm in now. Um, Great. and that's just sort of where I'm at today. Yeah. And Tara, I believe you may be the most recent MBA graduate of the bunch, uh, having graduated in 2021. Uh, I know that uh, we've got two 2019 grads, that's Brady and Robert. Uh, and Nathan, I wasn't able to find out when you graduated, because I know you pursued another graduate degree from Johns Hopkins after getting your MBA. Uh, but Nathan, why don't we go to you, uh, since I mentioned you last and your, uh, your decision to actually go for yet another graduate degree. Sure. And thanks. I'm, I'm also the third 2019 graduate. So there you go. Okay. Yeah, so sorry, you couldn't okay. find that. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Um, you know, my my path to an MBA was a was a bit unorthodox. I uh, so I studied neurobiology at the College of Worcester graduated in 2017. Um, but I actually missed some time in undergrad just from being sick. And, you know, being a neurobiology major, you know, it's a pretty you know, it's a one track degree where you're either going to pursue working in a laboratory or pursuing medical studies. And, and after, you know, missing all that time, I was pretty beat up both physically and, and mentally. And I realized that, you know, not being ready to pursue medicine and also not wanting to work in a lab and, you know, talk to the same five people and do the same monotonous procedures day in and day out. Although there's a lot of value in that, I just knew that wasn't for me. And so what I, really did is I had sort of a sit down with my parents and, you know, was really thinking about, you know, what can I do? And, and at that point in time, I always had an interest in pursuing more of an administrative side in medicine later on in my career. Um, and so at that point in time, I thought, you know, this might actually be a great time to matriculate into a business program at Case. Um, and, and very fortunately, and very luckily, I, I was accepted into that program. 
Um, and it was a it was an interesting transition. I went from studying endocrine pathways to balance sheets, and I, as a guy that had no idea what an ROI even was, uh, starting off, that was a it was a bit of a, an interesting um, you know um, hockey stick in terms of, of in terms of uh, you know knowledge acquisition. But what that throughout that program and throughout my my experience at the school, I was really able to combine my passions for medicine and business and really find myself a very unique niche in the healthcare industry. So where I sit right now is I sit in this really nebulous space between healthcare consulting, venture investing, and corporate development, where the company I work for, Plug and Play, we basically serve as that connective tissue, connecting all the right stakeholders within that specific ecosystem in order to bring new tech and solutions to market faster. So on a day-to-day basis, I'm constantly talking to different VCs, startups, corporations, so on and so forth. And so having that unique skill set of being able to speak to the to the R&D folks, as well as the administrative folks, um, has definitely propelled me uh, quite a bit in my career thus far. Great. Brady, how about your journey? Absolutely. Um, so I was, I was pretty focused on the world of finance uh, during undergrad. So I, I, that's where I wanted to be. Um, that's where I got my undergrad degree in. Uh, and then I took that into the tax world of global tax at State Street Bank. And um, I knew that a graduate degree, specifically an MBA, was something that I always wanted to do. Uh, I think after about a year and a half, 18 months of tax work, I decided it was a lot, it was in my future a lot sooner than I initially anticipated. So um, I used it as a bit of a career pivot for me to pivot from tax uh, more into the wealth management space of finance. So, and that's where I currently am. I work uh, financial planning analysis for a company called Stewart Partners. We're in the, we're we're an independent wealth management firm, so um, certainly where I wanted to end up, and um, still crunching numbers like nobody's business. Uh, and that's that's the <laughs> game. My MBA. So there you go. And we have another uh, wealth management person on the panel, uh, Robert. You're in uh, private wealth management as well with Bernstein. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, John, thanks for having me. Um, happy to share a little bit. Uh, I would have to go back to deciding in the process of applying to the Darrell Moore School, um, which I applied to our international MBA program, which at the time was considered a reach for me um, by outsiders and also myself. So just being accepted was uh, a feat in, in and of itself. Um, but the program was two years uh, in between um, we were, uh, slated to, to pick up and do an internship. Um, and it was just overall a great experience. The coursework, uh, the internship, which my advisors, you know, helped me land through different, um, events such as black MBA. Um, and that allowed me to understand really what I wanted to do, um, moving into my second year, which it was private wealth and, Yet again, my advisor helped me um, figure out and determine which would be the best platform uh, to associate myself with. And that turned out to be Bernstein. Uh, Before then, I had never heard of the company Alliance Bernstein. So I basically owe everything uh, to the Moore School. And, you know, looking back, uh, I I look very fondly at the experience and and happy to share, you know, my um, journey and highlights with you here today. And I should say that you brought uh, to the business school um, some rather unusual experience. Uh, you were working uh, in the House and had been a campaign manager for a congressional candidate. Um, and you had been, uh, I guess what, it's called a field representative. What does that mean when you work for the U.S. House of Representatives and your field yeah, so I, I wore many hats in my during my time working um for Congressman Yowdy, um, one of which I never gave up, which was to be his driver. But a field representative, I interface directly with constituents and businesses in our district. Um, and it wasn't until after um, he won what turned out to be the last uh, campaign re-election he participated in. You know, I, I vocalized that, um, you know, I was interested in 
in uh, higher education and specifically the international MBA program. And he basically told me, well, you better jump out the window before you get pushed because, you know, you can't be a legislative associate or field representative forever. So that was the encouragement I needed. And um, uh, yeah, it was to- it was definitely an unusual background. Not many people have that. Um, but that's why the business school was and the MBA program was so important to me and my success because I needed that um, to be able to position myself as an attractive candidate, you know, to firms and companies such as Alliance Bernstein. So pretty much everyone here made a career transition as a result of the MBA experience that they had uh, doing something very different from what they had done before. Uh, I wonder in going to business school, if that was your intent or that just happened to have to have to occur uh, as you explore different options. Uh, Tara, did you know what you wanted to do when you entered business school? Not at all. And I still don't know what I want to do. Um, I sort of <laughs> feel like every opportunity I've gotten in my career has happened when I was not planning on it. So uh, I fully went into um, business school and graduate school knowing that I wanted the MBA and I wanted the experience um, and I wanted to do it. Um, I went back part time while I worked full time. So I, I knew there were things that there were sort of mandatories that I had in mind that I was like, okay, get the degree, get the education, get the experience, do it on your time. And everything else, I kind of thought, well, you know, that'll be what it'll be. But I knew that I would be better positioned coming out of the program um, for whatever those opportunities would be. I actually did try to stay at my previous job. Um, I mentioned I was there for 10 years um, and I worked there during school. And when I graduated uh, with my MBA, I went to my boss, who I still have a great relationship with now, and I, I put a, together a whole deck and I said, you know, here's here's the value I can bring now with an MBA, and here's where I think I can apply value in our in our business. Um, you know, I'd love to hear from you on where you think I fit in because you know she was a senior executive, so she had that view where she could help me understand that. Um, right. And I, I asked for what I thought was a modest salary increase that would have brought me in line uh, with what is standard for someone with an MBA from from Zicklin in my market. And she very kindly said, "This is great. I don't have the budget for this," and so I left. Um, <laughs> and that's the and that's the job I'm at now. So. Um, I didn't see that coming. I mean, I did. I I knew that organization well enough to know that they weren't going to hand money out like that. But, um, you know, the the degree I got, I think, put me in a much better position competitively to get the role I have now. Um, I probably would have looked to leave regardless at that point. It was more about compensation and and being challenged in the workplace. But I think the MBA put me at the position that I'm in now to have achieved um, the uh, the upgrade in the work I'm doing compared to where I was previously. Right, makes sense. Uh, Brady, did you know you wanted to be in wealth management before you got your MBA? Uh, I had an idea. I guess it was uh, something I was interested in. Ironically, I uh, my internship um, similar uh, similar to Rob, it was a two year program. So my internship in between, I did uh, it was still uh, tax firm, but it was more on the independent uh, private client services side. Uh, so it was still kind of a cross between tax and wealth management. And that's when I realized, you know, you no know, tax, I just, I wanted to get out of taxes completely. Um, so that I think was the final, that was the final straw for me. And then uh, transitioning into wealth management was, I knew that's where I wanted to be in um, the fp role that I've been in for the last few years. It's really cool where it's a blend of what I learned in business school, more of the analytical side, it was certainly a focus for Eisenberg is the uh, data analytics and how important those are in every business today. Um, so I, I have that unique blend of, um, of using my degree while also being in the, uh, the industry that I want to be in and I love the company I'm at. So everything worked out. <laughs> Great. Nathan, what most surprised you about uh, the MBA experience? Did you went going to school, did you have certain expectations or beliefs that either were proven or disproven? Sure. You know, I, I came into the into the whole experience with a pretty open mind. So I wasn't necessarily coming in with the mindset of having certain things proven or disproven. Um, but I would say the the thing that I I especially appreciated throughout the experience is that Case Western's curriculum had very much a 
sort of a liberal arts-esque approach in the sense that it wasn't, hey, here's some information. And, you know, when you have a test or a final deliverable, we want you to, you know, reproduce that verbatim. It was more so this is how we are going to teach you and you have to apply that skill set or ap apply that knowledge base and use it in a, in a different way. And so, you know, as time goes on and even now, you know, now that I'm almost, you know, four, four or five years post uh, graduation, I still take a lot of those principles, um, especially as, you know, in my in my realm where I'm constantly getting exposed to new technologies and new models and, and new innovations, I constantly have to adopt that that lens and that mindset to say, OK, well, like, hey, you know, this has worked in this capacity, you know, obviously we're in a, we're in a space of disruption. How is this going to, you know, ultimately disrupt? Are there things that we can take as a predicate? Are there things that we have to rewire? Are there things that we have to build from the ground up, whatever that may be? Um, so I think that was a, was probably one of the more profound surprises and experiences being this far out saying like, oh, hey, like, you know, there's still so much that I, uh, that I draw on from, from those two years. Yeah. Robert, did you, did you have a surprise? Oof, did I have a surprise? Um, I think that there were many, um, but I'll say the biggest surprise is how meaningful the friendships of my cohort proved to be. Um, I see a lot of head nods, so um, that's probably a similar experience around uh, our group here, but um you know, mine was particularly special. Again, two-year program, six months of which were spent abroad. Um, I spent my time in Mexico, so I lived with, you know, seven of my classmates in a foreign country. That'll certainly bring you together. And oh, yeah. now I live in Atlanta, and uh, there are five um, classmates of mine, including myself here. And you know, we still get together quite frequently. We're having dinner as a group with spouses included on Sunday. You know, I texted them some of the questions that we were expecting to receive and, and jokingly said fake answers only. Um, and so we, we all got a good laugh out of that. That's great. That's great. Tara, talk a little bit about the learning experience. So you went part time, which meant I assume that you were working full time and doing the uh, the weeknight grind. How hard was that? Um. You know, it's funny because a lot of people, so I work in an industry where you don't get a lot of MBAs, um, you know, media, advertising, marketing, it's not, it's not really needed. Um, so a lot of people said, why are you doing this? This seems hard. Um, and I said, honestly, the, the course load and what I'm learning is not hard. Um, you know, it's, it's really the time management. That was probably the biggest challenge. Um, I was newly married when I went back to school. Um, I did not have children at the time. And, um, you know, honestly, it was just making sure my time management was on point. Um, you're exactly right. I was working full time and then I did two to three nights a week in person. Um, one semester I did a Saturday class, which actually was pretty good. Um, some people think that that sounds like torture, but I liked it. Um, and I did get interrupted by COVID. Um, so I did the last three semesters of my eight semester experience, uh, all virtual. Um, I also bought this apartment during that time. So a lot of upheaval, um, but it was really just like, it really just tested my organization skills, my time management skills, um, and just prioritizing, you know, sometimes it meant going to uh, a social engagement late or not at all. Um, and, you know, I think that that's the big difference between who I was as an undergrad, which was someone who, couldn't have cared less about school or grades or, you know, getting value out of my experience versus choosing to go back as an adult, um, you know, and really putting um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, prioritization on, you know, the time I'm putting in here it really is all about time management. Yeah, that that's, that's very true, particularly even in full-time programs with the core curriculum where they throw so much at you. Um, Nathan, I wonder how your experience uh, at your school and your MBA program compared to your undergraduate years and then your graduate degree at Johns Hopkins. That's a great question. Um, 
to be quite honest, it was pretty similar to the to the undergrad experience in the sense that um, obviously there was a core curriculum. You had the opportunity to take other classes that you know were were outside of the realm of interest, for lack of a for lack of a better term. Um, but also there were unique ways in which you could combine that curriculum with other internships or passions or interests, which I thought was, which was pretty mm-hmm. phenomenal, uh, just because it allowed you to try a lot of different things. And, and as we all know, you know, you hop into the workforce, you try something, you don't like it. And then you hop into the, you know, into the MBA program. And, and obviously it's a, it's a pretty finite amount of time. And so you're looking to try a couple different things so that you, when you, ultimately graduate, you find the role that is best suited for yourself. Um, right now at Johns Hopkins, I'm doing that on a, on a part-time capacity. And um, that one's a little bit different because it's more, it's more uh, thesis driven. Um, and it's, and I'm studying healthcare systems engineering. And as, as we all know, our, our system is extremely broken. So at this point in time, you know, there's just a lot of brain power that's going to exploring different ways in which we can fix the system and make it uh, a little bit more efficient with a different methodology. Um, the, 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 the schooling or, or the principles are rooted, um, in the in their applied physics laboratory which does a lot of the project management for the dod and nasa and other federal organizations and so they're trying to apply a lot of those same frameworks into the healthcare setting so um definitely a different experience but uh great nonetheless yeah and brady what was your experience like at eisenberg yeah uh, i'd actually say somewhat to nathan um it was uh i did the full-time program so in a way it is similar to undergrad in the sense all of a sudden you're back on a college campus doing that uh, all the time. But uh, the main difference, everyone uh, chooses and is voluntarily there. And that's, you know, certainly at Eisenberg that made it, uh, the culture was um, was incredible just because everyone is there for a reason and uh, they have a goal that they're trying to get out of the program, which I don't think is something you really experience in undergrad at all. So that. So like, I'm, I'm like, for me, like, I think the big thing was there were always team-based projects and group projects and stuff, which, quite frankly, in undergrad can be a drag, but in grad school, it was awesome because it was actually people who wanted to get together, collaborate, uh, share ideas, um, and that was, uh, that was really exciting. Uh, and then with, with Eisenberg, we had the flexibility to really kind of choose where our coursework uh, took us, and I say that in the sense that we had our core program for the first year, but in the second year, we really had flexibility in what we wanted to specialize in and or just explore. Um, I was able to do a whole consulting project with a local brewery just on operational improvement, which I thought was, you know, brewing, making beer. I love drinking beer, but uh, I don't think I'll ever you know, be a master brewer. So it was really cool to, you know, take my business skills into something that I would never really do otherwise and have an impact and, you know, do be able to experiment in that, in that regard. So, um, yeah, like I said, but the biggest thing too, I mean, people, people, people choosing to go back to grad school, everyone's there with a goal. I mean, it's really cool to, um, to experience that as a group. Yeah. And everyone is coming with work experience from which to exactly. make judgments and issue, you know, form opinions, uh, which obviously enliven every single class. Uh, you know, Robert, looking back on your MBA experience, are there th- three things that you can single out that still resonate with you today? Yeah. Um, you, you know, the process, one, the process in making yourself an attractive candidate for the job opportunities that you're pursuing, you know, everything from crafting your LinkedIn to you know, resumes, cover letters, uh, interviews, that whole process, um, going to you know the events that companies are present at, career fairs, um, you know, outside events from the school, um, that whole process in and of itself, um, you know, was was eye opening and something I really needed practice on. Uh, two, um, my teachers, specifically one advisor in particular really leaning into me and, and helping me achieve, you know, the goal that I had set out, um, of accomplishing, you know, without him, I wouldn't be here. Um, so I owe a lot to, to that person and, uh, truly grateful, 
you know, I want to mention he and classmates came to my wedding. So if that tells you anything about how meaningful those people uh, are in my life. And then third, third, um, let's see. Um, I would have thought it was your six months in Mexico. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting time for sure. Um, but just the, I, I would say, you know, that, that would might be too easy and, and take too long to describe. Um, but the, the third piece would be the activities and organizations that my, that I was involved with alongside my classmates outside of school. And that could be, you know, something as, as silly as forming a kickball team, but we sure had a good time doing it. Um, right. So, yeah. Tara, what are your three things? I would say the first thing that really stuck with me is um, the diversity. So Baruch, for those who don't know, is a um, CUNY school standing for City University of New York, part of the larger New York State, New York City public college system. Um, I went to a SUNY, State University of New York, for undergrad, um, and I, I felt that Baruch was going to be great in terms of giving me an equivalent uh, education for, uh, an affordable price. Um, and I only sound like I'm being paid by them because I work in advertising. I swear, uh, that's genuinely how I felt when I was applying. Um, but what's, what's, what really stuck with me, I, I mentioned all this because it's a CUNY because it's affordably priced. Um, the diversity of thought and of culture, um, is incredible. Um, I was in the minority in every sense of the word, um, both in my gender, um, in my ethnicity, in my uh, work experience, in, I mean, you name it, um, you know, I, I'm from New York originally. So, um, you know, you get a lot of folks like that, but you also get a lot of first generation um, uh, Americans, um, you know, people who are new to the country, international students. I know there's a lot of international students in a lot of business programs. Um, but I think the difference here is that, um, you know, it's just a sense of like, there's so much to absorb just by being around so many people with so many different perspectives. Um, and that was so valuable to me, um, especially as someone who is in an industry where, you know, I'm talking to different people, both in the course of my job and in terms of the audiences that I'm, I'm creating work for and distributing to. Um, I would say another thing is that even though I was a part-time student, um, you know, there was a plethora of, you know, extracurriculars, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily someone who had a mental bandwidth or physical ability to do a sport, but um, I, I, you know, appreciated that there were a lot of opportunities. There was something for everyone. I actually did join a program that was all about, um, it was called graduate ambassadors um, and basically just working with the program administrators at my school um, to engage students um, and to just um, sort of be like community leaders, um, which is something I've always enjoyed doing. Um, and I would say the third thing is um, I still, I mean, I've only been out of the program a little over two years, but um, you know, the professors were great. Like, I think that when you talk about going to a public school, um, especially one that isn't, you know, maybe as known, um, you know, nationally as a school like mine, that's maybe known more locally. Um, the professors are just incredible to the point where I have a friend who's um, on faculty, totally different discipline. She's like a, a dentist uh, faculty at Stony Brook and she's trying to put together a, a, a staff retreat. And she said, are there any professors from your time at Baruch that you would recommend who aren't going to be super boring and just talk about like, you know, right. the, the same old stuff. And I said, how many do you need? Like I can recommend like five. Um, so I, I still think about them. I still am in touch with them on LinkedIn and still getting a lot of value there. So I would say those are my three. Great. Uh, Brady, I wonder what uh, three things most resonated with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I think the first one I already touched on, but uh, the Eisenberg, like the core yeah. course book, um, has this built-in consulting project in the first year built into it. Um, so that was the biggest takeaway for me. It was like I consulting was not something that I ever really thought I would get or want to get into. And all of a sudden, we were forced right into it and taking our coursework and applying it hands-on and with small, uh, local small businesses. 
and that was really exciting. I enjoyed it so much I did it the second time with the company I chose. Um, so that was that was definitely the first one. Um, another thing that I and this is this I kind of miss about grad school a lot is, uh, you know, if you uh, if you apply and if you are an MBA student, never be afraid to share the fact that you are an MBA student. I can't tell you how many times I've been able to go, whether it's uh, some networking event or even just. Uh, walk into a company or you cold call someone on LinkedIn or something and just say, hey, I'm an MBA student and I want to know X, Y, Z. It's, uh, you know, you truly will not get as much of a response, you know, at any other time in your life, I feel like, especially professionally. Um, so those two. And then uh, number three, I mean, we've already touched on it. It's the people. I was like, a, it, I was in a full-time program. Um, it was funny Robert said that about uh, weddings. I had two, uh, two weddings this past summer two of my classmates actually got married. So it's like, it, uh, they're best friends, uh, and they're my best friends, but at the same time, they are like the, the core element of your professional network, right? Like those are people that you see on a daily basis for, you know, 18 to 24 months. And uh, those relationships, they last forever. And, you know, you always have your cohort to, to um, go back to, which is awesome. Yeah, very true. Um, Nathan, you're the three things that meant the most to you. Sure. Um, I would say, as everyone else has mentioned, are the, are the professors, you know, we were really blessed to have extremely small class sizes. So it gave us a really intimate setting to learn, um, way more than, you know, you would just pick up from the textbook, just things that they've experienced life, so on and so forth. I think that was pretty phenomenal. Um, I would say another thing would be, just the network itself. It's amazing how many people from Case Western end up staying in the region. But even now, when we, even when we were in under, or, um, excuse me, in, in graduate school in the MBA program, or even now after the graduate program, I can go to pretty much any city that I travel to. I can see who's in that region. And 9.9 .9 out of 10 of those folks are willing to sit down, have a, have a meal with you, have a beer, have some coffee, learn, learn a little bit about each other. Um, so on and so forth. Um, and then it's a good question. I would probably say the the third thing would be really just, you know, it's more so getting back to the curriculum, just the way that they teach you how to think. Um, and also the way that they teach you to take on new challenges and new opportunities. I, I very much feel that, you know, the MBA program is a and, and, you know, just most graduate programs are a contact sport. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And so they give you, I mean, it's essentially for lack of a better uh, analogy, it's like a batting cage. They're going to keep throwing pitches at you and you just got to swing. You just got to swing and um, <laughs> see what, see what hits. <laughs> Hopefully the pitch is accurate and goes over the plate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's a, it's, it's a slow <laughs> softball, easy stuff. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But yeah, it's uh that that's probably the third thing. <laughs> So Nathan, was there one thing that you wish you had done in your program that you didn't in retrospect? That's a good question. I would say in a way, I wish I would have had a little bit more real world experience. And I feel like that would have educated me a little bit more as far as the direction that I would have taken starting off in business school. However, on, on the flip side, you know, kind of going in green and being this malleable ball of clay, um, I was able to learn a lot of things from an academic lens. And so when I hopped right into the professional world afterwards, um, I was, you know, by far and away, a much more equipped to tackle really tough challenges than, than others. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg question there, but um, yeah. Overall, that that would probably be the the only thing was just be maybe better understanding how I could utilize it right off the bat. It took a little bit of time talking to peers, talking to professors, talking to, you know, the administrative departments. But you know, after after a month or two, I was pretty much set on the right course. Sarah, how about you? Anything you wish you had done at Baruch that you didn't quite get around to doing? No, th this might be. Um sort of a lame answer but like there are some courses I didn't get around to taking just because like I had to graduate eventually um and you know <laughs> money I I don't have a money tree to continue funding unlimited courses um but yeah I I think that ultimately 
I, I wanted to put essentially uh, 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag, right? Like I just wanted to take a lot more courses than I, than I had the bandwidth to do. Um, so that maybe, maybe not the, 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 the most exciting answer, but um, there's a couple things out there that I'm still like, Oh, maybe I can look up the syllabus and just buy those books and like learn on my own, you know? <laughs> sure. You are a glutton for punishment, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I just love school. What can I say? Uh, Robert, anything you wish you had done? Um, I was thinking about that just now and I, I really don't have any regrets. Um, so if I really like had, Sinatra, regrets, I've had a few, but too few to mention. That's right. Um, if I had to dig deep, I would say, um, and this would, this would be advice to the, the people listening and, and it, is a little conflicting with what Tara said, but in general, like know what you want to get out before going in, but understanding that that can evolve over your time there. Unfortunately, sure. like I knew I didn't want to be in government. I knew like what I didn't want to do. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I, I wanted to be in business and wanted to evolve specifically in finance. Um, and so, you know, try to have a, a, understanding to the best of your abilities going into it, understanding that that can evolve and change over time. Um, that's what I would say. Okay. That's great. Uh, Brady, how about you? Anything that happened at Eisenberg that you kind of missed out on that you wish you, you had participated in? Um, if anything, I, uh, I, I felt like I may have just been too, uh, focused on finance specifically while I was there and didn't necessarily give myself the opportunity to explore to explore other um, career choices. And not that I didn't have that ability. I just, you know, looking back, I almost want to take my own advice and go to a consulting firm or a, a operations opportunity to say, hi, I'm an MBA student. Like, what can you tell me? Um, or, you know, what can you tell me about your uh, field? Uh, so um, I certainly enjoy what I do and I got as much as, I could get out of Eisenberg uh, to do that. Um, but having those, you know, MBA school is a very unique opportunity to get perspective you would never otherwise get. So I feel like maybe I should have done a little more of that while I was there. Yeah. So Brady, six years ago, you were in the same position as most of the people who will be watching this webinar, uh, <laughs> applying to schools and trying to get in. Uh, I wonder now with all that you've been through, what advice you would give to your younger self, um, the person who was applying to business schools back six years ago? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, keep your head up. Uh, rejection happens. It's going to happen no matter what you do, no matter where you are. Uh, you just got to take the punches and keep on rolling. Um, but more, more, more importantly, you know, that only leads to, when you have the opportunity that um, that you get, make the most of it at the same time, right? Like once you get that opportunity, uh, take it head on uh, and give it your all. Um, and when it comes to an MBA program, like I said, try try something that you wouldn't have tried otherwise. Get out of your comfort zone. Uh, get that perspective you didn't think you wanted or needed, but you never know. It could help, you know, five years down the road. Um, and just make sure to really try to soak up as much as you can once you uh, once you get into the program. Robert, your advice to a current applicant? Yeah, I would just say try to understand understand yourself the best you can, and be able to tell and craft that story that you know the people in admissions are going to be hearing, and and make yourself unique and stand out to the best of your abilities while being true to yourself. Um, also be specific, you know, I, I wouldn't advise applying to 30 different MBA programs, you know, maybe narrow that down to whatever number you deem appropriate and that you are drawn to for some specific reasons and be able to talk about that. Right. And uh, Tara? Yeah, I would say that the advice given so far, I would agree with, you know, um, rejection doesn't mean failure. It just means that there's an opportunity that hasn't presented itself to you yet. Um, so I would say um, don't be discouraged uh, by rejection. It's just kind of part of life. Um, and then I would say that once you're in a program, um, 
I think you're going to get in what you're going to get out of it, what you put in. Right. So I think right. we've probably all been in school with people who you sort of engage with them. Hopefully not that many. Um, I didn't come across this that often, but every now and then I'd come across someone and I'm like, you're paying for this, right? Like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, like, I think, you know, I don't think it's as much of an issue. I think Brady was saying like, the nice thing about going back to school um, is that everyone wants to be there. It's voluntary and everybody um, is generally pretty goal oriented, um, which I would totally agree with that, that totally tracks with my experience. But I would say that like, you need to really be the leader of your own journey through grad school. Like there's only so much that um, showing up is going to get you. You need to um, be inquisitive and seek things out, seek out, you know, people's advice, seek out mentorship, seek out additional information um, and just like be curious and just put a lot into it. And you're going to get so much back as a result. Good advice. Nathan, you get the final word. Uh, what would you tell your younger self? That's a tough spot to be in because I, I agree with uh, with all the uh, all the previous comments. Um, you know, I guess you know when you're considering all of these different schools, I would you know also think a little bit outside the box and see you know, what are the core competencies of that specific school and what are some other unique opportunities you can take advantage of? So, you know, Case Western, obviously Weatherhead is a, is a extremely great name, um, but the school itself has an extremely strong medical and engineering um, presence. And so for me, you know, that was a big thing knowing that, hey, I, I'm going to go into business school at Case but I will also have the ability to network and leverage relationships with other schools and other departments that all sit under the university's umbrella. Um, and so even though that wasn't necessarily uh, an anticipated outcome that I was expecting throughout that experience, it was definitely something that I relished and really appreciated as time went on, just because I was able to bounce different ideas off of different departments and different faculty and, and really give myself a better understanding of how the world works from different perspectives. And, you know, that's probably the biggest thing in healthcare right now is, you know, physicians and admins and, you know, the, the, the other uh, industry players and stakeholders, they, they all speak a different language and look at things differently. Um, and so having that ability to create that multidisciplinary uh, mindset for yourself is, is pretty invaluable. Well, let me thank each and every one of you for participating. I think you um, lent a lot of insights to your both your careers and to your MBA experience. Really appreciate it. Uh, so for all of you out there, I hope you had a good session here. Uh, just to remind you, we had Brady from UMass Eisenberg, Tara from Baruch Zicklin, uh, Nathan from Case Western Reserve, um, with uh, Weatherhead School of Management and Robert uh, from the University of South Carolina, the Darla Moore School. Uh, thanks for watching and good luck on your MBA journey. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants.